Hey, you are listening to another episode of Middle-Aged and Mediocre, episode 23 to be exact. I'm Cash. I'm Joel. And we are bringing you um, another story of murder and death and all kinds of other stuff in these wonderful times. Yeah. If you're not depressed already. <laughs> Some light listening. We're here to bring you down further. Uh, right yeah, off you were the... texting me about that, and I was like, good. I was like, you know, more heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what we need. Yeah, right off the bat, I do want to say, this will be the first time we've had to do this, um, but I do want to give a warning for this episode. <laughs> how is this? The, like, all this stuff we've talked about. Yeah. Like, this is, like, how? what is? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's going to take a while to get into the stuff where it's like, there's a certain section, and when we get to that section, I will once again give okay. a warning. But I do want to just, right off the bat, say, this is going to be a heavy episode to anyone listening. Um, there's, so lock your kids in the basement. Well, there's Shame. child abuse oh. involved. Uh, there's super fucking brutal things happening to people. Wow. Uh, I When I started the story... Is it the story about the Jackson 5? <laughs> No, oh, okay. no one's a winner here. <laughs> like at least, <laughs> well, I mean, at least no Michael had some success. <laughs> yeah, Janet, you know, Janet. Tito cool. did all right. I think Janet, you know, she showed her titty at the Super yeah. Bowl. Yeah, people know Tito's name. Yeah, some a few Jermaine. people. Heard I think of I'd say Jermaine over Tito. You have think? Have a fight to the death, and we'll find out. They're yeah, I mean, I think if you ask if people to list alive, the Jacksons, yeah. more would be able to list Tito. See, I would think Jermaine. I really? Think it, I think it would be Michael, Janet, Jermaine, then Tito. Oh, man. I just think the name Tito sticks Tito. out. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't know he's a Jack. Maybe they would just, like, associate the name Tito. Like he's a one-name person like Madonna? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did Tito? Did Tito ever do anything? I don't know. Like, other than the Jack, because I don't know what any of them did other than uh, Janet and Michael. Yeah, I think, like, afterwards, like, the Jacksons, you know, still kind of put out CDs. I'm sure he put out. Solo albums and I wonder how often and the other Jacksons got a hold of Janet and Michael. Were like, you guys want to do something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are you guys? I up got to? this idea for a song where you do all the singing and yeah. I just kind of put my name on it too. Yeah, I thought I'd be in the background going, "Yeah, <laughs> hey, harmonizing." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay. So that's out of the way. Randy Jackson was probably Randy Bone. <laughs> was Randy the other one? Was there another one called Randy? I, there's Randy Jackson on American Idol, but I don't think there was a Randy I don't Jackson. Think he's one of the, the Jacksons. Jackson. Oh, he's not okay, one of the Jacksons. Okay, okay. So there's Michael, there's Janet, Tito, Jermaine. There's four. There was because the Jackson, but the Jackson Five wasn't Janet. It well, was Janet Mike. wasn't in that. Yeah, right? yeah. It was Michael and the four brothers. Tito, Jermaine. <laughs> what are we My, talking Michael, about? Michael, Tito, Jermaine. <laughs> oh, nobody knows. Nobody knows two. No, Lamar. Sure. <laughs> Lavar, Lamar, Lamar, and Lavar. Those are the <laughs> other Lavar. Yeah. Lavalo Ball. He was one of them. He's like they're like the new ball. Yeah, like Lamelo. Yeah. And, all right. Yeah, I don't know. I that's the most I've ever thought of the Jacksons. Here really. We go. All right. So it's been and, a fun episode, and that's the episode, guys. So, like I said, warning. <laughs> yep. I wanted to warn you all. <laughs> We're talking about a pedophile. Uh, Supposedly, allegedly, allegedly, he did it. Probably. Yeah. I don't know anymore. Uh, after watching that, I watched that documentary. Oh, that was tough. I couldn't make it. I made it about halfway through. I was like, Ugh. I thought the guys were full of shit. Like I got, yeah, I got the gist of it. I was like, all right, it's just gonna be these people, just yeah, you know. But it's whatever. He was a weird dude. He was definitely a weird dude. Uh, speaking of weird things, you watched uh, a movie yeah. yesterday, today, I, today, today. Woke up and I was like, I know I'll start this day. With the lighthouse, you watched the lighthouse because I lost the. You gave me the digital copy and I lost that. But it's on Amazon, Amazon now. Prime. Yeah. So I watched it on that, and it's a real mind fuck. Yeah, yeah. I still don't know what the hell happened in that movie. It's weird, man. Like they do. Uh, I read like an interview with the director mm-hmm. who he also did the witch. Well, um, Those brothers, right? That directed it or something. It's Robert Eggers. I thought there's two of them. Because I was reading the IMDb oh, maybe. about it. Okay. I know Robert Eggers. Yeah, like maybe his brother wrote one. it or they helped. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. But, like, he was talking about how... Uh, so he took, like, two stories. Um, so the story of, uh, like, Greek like myth, like, mythology, he's really into that. Uh-huh. So, like, there's uh, Proteus, which is, like a, like, a Greek sea god, kind of. And he, like, knew, like, all about, like, um, the sea and, like, everything in it and he whatever like he was it wasn't poseidon but he was like proteus was like the ultimate knowledge yeah. holder of everything and then prometheus was the one who that's the alien movie Pr- yeah yeah <laughs> but prometheus was the one that wanted um 
he climbed the mountain. He climbed Mount Olympus and stole fire from the gods. Uh-huh. And to punish him, Zeus would make him every day roll uh, a stone up the mountain. I believe, or he would he made him uh, chained up, and every day he would be consumed by crows. Oh, uh, and he'd relive it every day. That was his punishment. Uh-huh. So in the movie. Uh, Willem Dafoe is Proteus. Okay. And then uh, Robert Pattinson yeah. is Prometheus. And they're both really good. So Prometheus, Robert Pattinson, uh, basically pisses off Proteus. Mm-hmm. And then, like at one point he climbs the mountain, which yeah. is the lighthouse, and he steals fire, which is he looks into the light. Uh-huh. So, and then he's punished at the end where you see him getting mm-hmm. eaten by. So it's kind of like those two stories and he just combined them. Yeah, it's a it's a weird. I, I don't know. I still don't get it. It's a weird fucking movie, man. Yeah, it's all black and white. It's all black and white. It's basically those two. Yeah, there's like a mermaid chick kind of. Yeah, it like that's a... all. So there's like you gotta like gotta interpret like whatever your mind comes up with for some of it. So like how much of it was in like how much of it was real, how much of it was just in his mind, yeah, and the like, character's mind because he went crazy basically. Yeah. Like, or, like, did any of it really happen? Like, was it just one person there? Like, we're, That's what I was waiting, yeah. We so it's just different shit. Like, you can interpret it different ways, but it's so fucking good. Yeah, I just, just love the it's performances. It's different from anything else, which is kind of cool. Willem Dafoe's accent kills me. Yeah. Because he's just, like, old-timey sea captain. Yeah, he's kind of like the guy from uh, Spongebob. Are you ready, yeah. kids? Yeah. <laughs> he farts the whole movie. Yeah. Did you watch it with uh, subtitles? No. By any chance? Or captions? I, no. Captions. Uh, if you watch it with captions on, uh-huh. then there's like a ton of times when he farts that you can't hear it. Oh, <laughs> but it says on the screen farts. <laughs> <laughs> so like all through the movie, uh, Willem Dafoe's just like farting, yeah. just walking around. And then at one point, Robert Pattinson loses his fucking mind, yeah. like, yelling about the farts. <laughs> it's the ri- most ridiculous movie, but I love it. It was a weird way to start the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like at the end where he looks into the light. It's kind of up to you to, like... That was a crazy scene. Yeah. Like, are we, like... Basically, it goes back to the whole thing of, like, is man, like... Is, like, humankind supposed to see the answer? Yeah. And if you do, it drives you mad. So that's why he didn't show what it was. Uh-huh. This is up to your own. And he was yelling, and just the noises in that movie was weird. The, just the, the... Yeah. Everything about it. I love it. I've, Off-putting. It and Witch both are really good. I'll have to watch Witch next. It's slow, too. Like, it's very... Uh, it only, it's like about a family they're like they're kind of off of themselves so it's like only or like four or five characters and then I don't a know if I, talking I, goat yeah, oh talking goat mm-hmm. Adam it's Sandler the devil so you just steal from Adam Sandler now it's basically an Adam Sandler movie okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not definitely gonna watch it yeah I think it Adam now. Sandler wrote both of them <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah uh, uh, so yeah that's I recommend that movie alright if you haven't watched it but yeah go watch The Witch and then let me know yeah. Have you ever seen Hereditary? I don't think I have. It's not the same guy, but it came out the same time as The Witch. Is uh, that with that chick in it? There is a chick in it. <laughs> it's like her mom yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, I think I did watch that. It's actually. really good. Yeah, it's like they like they, it, they all kind of remind me of the same uh, mood and atmosphere as like Midsummer. Yeah, Midsummer. Just really weird crazy. fucking yeah. horror movies. That's what I thought of Midsummer a couple times when I was watching Lighthouse. Mm-hmm. You will when you watch The Witch too. It's just those movies that just kind of just throw you off your balance or something yeah. and just I don't know they're just different I like different they're supposed to put out a midsummer like an edition of it that's like an extra 35 minutes yeah it was already long as fuck yeah, yeah. It was like I thought I, got, I bought that for Mike for Christmas and after I bought it I realized I didn't get the one with all the extras because that's what we I saw I can't too. imagine what else is it's gotta be just 20 minutes of hammering people with that giant hammer <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm totally cool with that if it's just 20 more minutes of that yep. I would love if it's just and not even like more people like the person with the, the hammer same has to like stop catch his breath yeah. eat a sandwich he like has conversations with the people watching yeah like alright well I gotta get back to work so what brought you here <laughs> Today's hammering. <laughs> it's hammer time. Is this your oh, first hammering? Is yeah. this the first one you've watched? <laughs> yeah, that movie was. I I don't know how you were in the theater. I mean, I know you and Mike were high. Yeah, oh yeah. But like, I think I ate a gummy too. When they're probably. walking up the mountain, like you knew some shit. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I was just like, what is going? On? Like I knew they were <laughs> jumping. I knew something, but then I did not expect a hammer. Yeah, the first one did good. Jumped head first. Died, yeah, that's how you do Yeah, it. the other one's like, I'm gonna jump feet first. Like it's Dumb water. Ass. It just yeah. bounces off that stone. <laughs> yep. Ah, oh, so good. You got hammered. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Like speaking of fucked up things, you want to get into the story? 
Yeah. All right. Uh, so this is kind of this is one of the more modern ones I've done. Uh huh. I usually go back into like the early 1900s, 1800s. This one takes place uh, 70s and 80s. So, and I was looking for a story about a uh, cult, um, about cults, like some sort of cult story, uh-huh. because of everything happening right now and like where. Her stuff happening right now? Just, just fucking the cult of Trump. Like, it just blows my mind. Yeah. But, like, so I really wanted to do something about a cult. Uh-huh. And I kind of, like, read a couple little things. And this is the story of a guy. This takes place in Canada. Okay. And in the very French part of Canada. Oh. So this guy's name is Roque, R-O-C-H, uh, Theriault. And it's T-H-E-R-I-A-U-L-T. Okay. Ro- Roque Theriault. That was almost my name. So I'll be calling him just Roque. Okay. Uh, but this is Roque and the Ant Hill. And the Ant Hill Kids. <laughs> and the Ant Hill Kids. Yeah, so uh, the name kind of caught my... <laughs> it sounds like, uh, what What was those, those old... The I mean, My Gang or... what? The uh, Little Rascals? <laughs> yeah, Little yeah. Rascals. or the uh, Appleseed. <laughs> yeah. What is the Appleseed Gang? Oh, that, just called? Makes, that makes me think Little Rascals. Could be Long Stocking Movies or okay. something. Yeah, yeah. The, the name caught my mind, caught my eye. And so then, as I wrote the story out yesterday, uh, I was learning about it as I went. Which I usually already know what's happening in all uh-huh. these. So as I was reading this, when it starts getting, I was like, "Oh fuck!" I was like, "We're in it now." Like, <laughs> I've already written the page. So uh, credit for most of the episode goes to um, a podcast um, that the podcast is just called Cults. Mm-hmm. It's on Spot- Spotify. It's part of the Parcast Network, um, and there's these two people, Greg and Vanessa, who host it. I got most of the information from that because uh-huh. there was really, I don't know why, but there was not a ton of information out there about this. I mean, I'm guessing in Canada, there might, Canada, there's probably, a this is probably, like a, I would assume a pretty big thing. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but all right. So let's get into this. Uh, Roque was born on May 16th, 1947 in Saguenay, uh, Quebec, Canada. He had a very normal childhood when he was six Though his family uprooted and moved to a mining town, uh, Roke spent most of his time reading books, often borrowing them from his school so he could read them from his home. Roke seemed to have a superiority complex from an early age, and being an avid, avid reader could have been a part of this, as he would have felt more intelligent and more well-read than anyone in his family, and most likely all of his neighbors, as he lived in a town full of miners who had to trade education in at an early age to begin working and providing for their families. Uh, to hear Roke tell it, he had an awful upbringing. Um, he, this all turned out to be lies. Yeah. But he would tell people that he, from the ages of like two to fourteen, that he was routinely beaten. Um, that he was thrown out of the house at fourteen and told never to come back. Uh, that, um, he was treated like a dog. Uh huh. None of this is true. Like he would tell people that his dad was a violent drunk. Just told people that to get sympathy. Just, and... He played the victim yeah. a lot. Um, his Imagine. his desire for education uh, seems to also all point back towards the superiority complex as he taught himself how to speak English while the rest of his family and everybody in the town spoke French. Uh, his family, or his father, was named Hyacinth. H-I-A-C-Y-N-T-H, which I think is a... F- flower um and he forced roke to participate in his religious and political activism hyacinth made all of his children wear white berets and march with him in military fashion as they would go door to door and get down on their knees to beg the neighbors to offer donations to the group called the white berets i mean other than the getting on your knees that sounds pretty badass (laughs) everyone wearing the same hat marching well these white berets also known as the pilgrims of saint michael uh, held conservative Catholic beliefs and the labor philosophy of social credit, aka the redistribution of wealth among people, aka somewhat socialism. Um, but unlike socialism, the White Berets still believed in owning private property and privately run companies. The group would hold militaristic rallies and march around like they were an army, though. Uh, Roke's friends and neighbors all made fun of him for wearing the White Beret and marching around, which just Makes sense. Which just, like, assaulted (laughs) his ego. Yeah. Um, It would drive him to hate the White Berets. 
And since they were rooted in Catholicism, he grew to hate Catholicism as well. He couldn't stand that his friends and neighbors all laughed and looked down on his family and himself for being a part of the White Berets. He hated the disapproval of others and hated being humiliated. I can't say that word. (laughs) Humiliated. He also hated having to follow orders. Aside from the unusual religious and political activism, Roke had a very normal 1950s childhood. His parents believed in strict discipline and obedience, but friends of the family remember the parents being firm but loving parents who loved their kids and loved each other. Roke excelled at school, always scoring in the high 90s. At age 13, he came in either first or seventh on his seventh grade final exams, and his teachers all believed he had a bright future ahead of him. Instead, Roke dropped out of school after eighth grade, shocking his teachers. It was a challenge for him. Well, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Between the superiority complex, achieving higher grades than everyone else, hating having to take orders from authority, and a lack of encouragement from his family as far as academics go, it's likely that he dropped out simply because he felt that he was already smarter than everyone else Mm -hmm. and that he was above going to school. He spent his time after leaving school mowing lawns to earn money and hanging out in dance halls. He quickly found a new way to feel superior to everyone else, though. He had the ability to attract women without much effort. He was intelligent, had piercing blue eyes, was charismatic and charming, and he had the gift of a huge dong. <laughs> Jesus. Roke was packing. Let me see. He be- Fortunately, there was no pictures. Oh, man. He believed that his large dick and sexual prowess made him special. He was able to get almost any woman he wanted. As a teen, he dated a lot of girls in his town, but in 1967... Uh, the 20-year-old Roque married 17-year-old Francine Granier. They lived together for a time in a home near his parents' house that he'd built himself. Uh, which, that big dick. If he, you know, again, if his father kicked him out at 14 and his parents hated him, like, they wouldn't let him build a house yeah. <laughs> um, on, his, on the property. Uh, the pair got along very well. Before long, they moved to Montreal together, where Roque got a job as a chimney inspector. He enjoyed drinking, but was described mostly as a happy drunk who would joke around and pull pranks on others. In 1969, the couple had their first child, Roke, uh, Roke Jr. In 1971, Francine gave birth... What's the size of the kid's dong? They did not talk about that. No, that was not a big part of the podcast. (laughs) Uh, Francine gave birth to their second son, Francois. Francois. It was during the second pregnancy that Francine saw Roke's personality begin to shift. Uh, Roke had began to complain constantly of stomach pain, and he saw a doctor and was informed that he had several uh, ulcers that needed treated with surgery immediately. He had two surgeries where doctors removed a large portion of his stomach, and the surgeries did not go well. Uh, after the second surgery, Roke spent months vomiting and suffering suffering severe stomach pain. In January of 72, Roke went back to his doctor, who explained to Roke that he was suffering from dumping syndrome. Those affected with dumping syndrome can't digest food properly. Food moves from the stomach to the small intestine before the body can properly digest it and absorb the nutrients. Uh, It still actually occurs pretty frequently in people who have had gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. But now um, doctors come up with specialized diets. And if they follow the diets, it takes care of it. Um, They didn't know all this in 69 or No, not enough to... Yeah. uh, Roke attempted to treat his condition with antacids, but the pain never went away. This warped Roke from a happy-go-lucky guy to someone who was in constant pain, and he began to develop obsessions as his mental health deteriorated. His love of reading became more about an obsession to read medical textbooks. He began reading everything he could about his condition before developing a need to read everything there was to read about medicine in general. Those around him began to notice that his chronic pain had changed who he was as well. His wife, Francine, would later write that after the surgery and the following downward spiral, Roke went from someone who loved his sons to someone who only cared about himself. Uh, mental health professionals have noted that chronic illnesses can cause already mental ill people to unravel, which Roke definitely did. He quit his job and made his family move back to the mining town where he'd grown up. He also began to say that his insides were now plastic. <laughs> he just kept telling everybody that he had plastic on it in, inside of his body and that he was going to die soon. Uh, Some believe that the chronic pain combined with obsession with reading medical books, Roke could have become a hypochondriac. Uh, Even though stomach pain was very real, it wasn't life-threatening at all. Yeah. Uh, Being a hypochondriac and a narcissist with a superiority complex, though, Roke is beginning to learn new ways of playing the victim. 
Everything about his personality seemed to change. Before his surgeries, he would insist that Francine wore long dresses so that other men wouldn't look at her. But after the surgeries, he began wanting her to wear, insisting that she wear short skirts and show off her legs to everybody. Oh. He also began to talk nonstop about sex and even talked constantly about starting a nudist colony. <laughs> uh, Roke opened Wanted up to a, show off that dong. Apparently so. Uh, Roke opened up a wood shop on his family's property. Again, family must not hate him too much. Yeah. Where he made furniture and beer mugs, which I found to be a weird combination. What? <laughs> make like wooden beer steins? He apparently or would make something? like a wooden, he'd like yeah. make hand carved beer steins, yeah. yeah. Uh, he eventually ran the business into the ground, however. The business was failing in 1975 when Roke suddenly became interested in politics. He even won a seat on the city council, charming the other council members. He had plenty of ideas, but he actually never had any way of making the plans work. Uh, while at first impressed by Roke's knowledge of the municipal code book, the other board members couldn't stand him after long, as he often threw ten- temper tantrums and wouldn't compromise on anything. He stopped showing up for meetings in 1976 and was voted off the board. The family was now living primarily on welfare, and Francine began to assume that Roke's frequent trips to go sell his hand-carved mugs were actually just excuses for him to go to town and shoot on her. Roke was no longer all that worried about his family, but instead had become convinced that the medications he took for his stomach problems were damaging his sex life and making it more difficult to meet and attract young women. Focused solely on <laughs> the <regaining>, marriage, <laughs> it was made it hard enough to do that. <laughs> and you now he's got this damn stomach yeah. pain and these medicines. Maybe it's guilt there, Roke. Yeah. Probably not with this guy. Focused solely on regaining his sexual prowess, he stopped taking the medication. Yeah, baby. And went from a social drinker to a full-blown alcoholic. Nice. Uh, Roke's life was an absolute mess in the spring of 1976, but in February, Roke met 24-year-old Giselle at a dance party that he was supposedly at to sell his beer mugs, but was actually attending just to meet women. He invited her back to his hotel room. She liked the charisma and confidence, and even though she didn't go back to his room that night, she gave Roke her note, her phone number, and it didn't take long for her to become his girlfriend. Uh, he told Giselle that he was dying of cancer and that his wife was cheating on him. He also told her that his stomach issues had began in childhood when his father punched him in the stomach violently. Jeez. Roke divorced Francine, and by the summer of 76, Roke and Giselle traveled around the Quebec province... Uh, camping out in tents and selling Roke's mugs, which he must have made some great mugs. Yeah. I mean, if you can make a living off selling beer mugs, that's pretty good. Well, they're living in a tent. <laughs> it's not much okay. of a living. Okay. You know what? Fair point. Uh, Roke's drinking continued to grow worse and worse, and while Giselle was swept up in the romance of it all at first, <laughs> she, of the... The romance of the beer of the mug traveling, life. Yeah, yeah. Of the tent traveling The tent life. living beer mug life. But he's got that big dick. That big dick so, life. you know. Um, he's in constant pain. He's yeah. drunk all the time. But um, she quickly began to notice disturbing changes in Roke's personality. He became obsessed with religion, convinced that he understood the Bible better than the Catholic Church. Roke began to use the Bible to prove to people that he was superior to them. Giselle remembers him obsessing. That's over, the best way to use the Bible. That's, I think, the main way. To use the Bible. <laughs> yeah. uh, from my experience, uh, Giselle remembers him obsessing over sections of the Bible that demand women be obedient to men. In the early month of 77, Roke found a new religion in the Seventh-day Adventist church, which had begun looking for converts in the mining town Roke lived in. Uh, Seventh-day Adventism was the result of a doomsday movement founded by William Miller in the 1800s. Miller had convinced his followers that the second coming of Christ would occur on October 22, 1844. Thousands of his followers sold everything they owned in anticipation of Christ's return. Smart. But when the day passed and Jesus no-showed, many followers just abandoned Miller. One of his followers, however, was convinced that Miller had been correct about the date, but had simply been wrong about the location. Mm. You see, according to this follower, Jesus hadn't cleansed the earth. No, no. He had cleansed a heavenly sanctuary. He is still in heaven. He Uh, was taking care of heaven first. Yeah. He'd get here. All right, if you guys could relax a little bit. Yeah, just calm down, everybody. (laughs) We've waited 1,844 I mean, years, <laughs> or however this all works out. The follower of Miller gained his own followers, and this group became the Seventh-day Adventists, Adventists, still believing the second coming of Christ was imminent. So back to 1977, and this group was looking for recruits. Roke was attracted to this new religion and found their ideas engaging. 
He began attending every session they had and loved the idea of turning to a new religion and being able to thumb his nose at the white berets and his father's Catholic religion. He also enjoyed the idea of an imminent apocalypse. He'll show them. He'll love God, God even, even more. more. <laughs> He'll love God to death. Yeah. Uh, he ended up adopting the idea of the imminent apocalypse as one of his own, that he thought of it, basically. Oh, okay. Um, he was baptized by the Adventists, and at first, the new religion seemed beneficial to his mental health. And staying in line with beliefs of the Adventists, Roke quit smoking and drinking, and even began to eat a healthy vegetarian diet. He convinced Giselle to convert along with him. Uh, while it seemed that the new religion was making him a better person, it soon became clear that Roke's narcissism and habit of playing the victim was being fed by his newfound fellowship. He would force the other members to listen to his stories of a tragic childhood. <laughs> His pastor, Pierre Zita, was especially concerned by Roque's behavior. He still felt compelled, though, to help him. And since Roque was unemployed, Zita got him a job selling Seventh-day Adventist pamphlets. Which, I don't... They sell them? Apparently, yeah. Like, you would go and sell the pamphlet? <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck is gonna buy it? You can't even give them away for free. Yeah. Oh, well, Roque was amazing at this, though. Yeah. He had charisma. He had salesmanship. He knew ways to market it. He had a big dick. He had a big dick. He had that big dick swagger. Right. Big yeah. dick energy. Yeah, big so dick energy. He sold. He was great at this. Uh, and he began combining that sales pitch with another sales pitch for the anti-smoking clinics that the church would put on. Other members of the church were very impressed by Roke's salesmanship and marketing strategies, and Roke ate up the praise, respect, and attention. Just a few weeks after starting to sell the pamphlets, however, Roke began to resent that the other members were following Pastor Zita and not him. I mean, he's been at it two weeks. Two whole weeks. <laughs> uh, Roke wanted the power, control, and praise. He wasn't interested in spreading the word of the Seventh-day Adventists as much as he was interested in gaining followers followers of his own. He loved Facebook and like Twitter and stuff. Dude, he would have been he'd have been president. Yeah, especially on Twitter, he chose big dick. <laughs> Uh, just the outline of it. Uh, he started gaining followers uh, followers of his own in the summer of 1977, including a young woman named Solange. She was 21 years old, bright and rebellious. She had an unhappy upbringing and loathed her father, who abused her and everyone else in her family. She had the actual sister Solange. That's what yeah. I thought. Okay, yeah. So she had the actual bad childhood. childhood yeah. That Roke said he had. Yeah. Um. Solange and her friends were all young and had begun attending the Seventh-day Adventist meetings where they were quickly targeted by Roke. The group consisted of a young man named Jacques Fizet, Jacques. which is a wrestler, clearly, 19-year-old Chantel, and 18-year-old Francine. Chantel had a happy home life. She was a daydreamer with loving parents, but she was prone to moodiness and depression. Chicks, man. <laughs> uh, Francine was outgoing, but secretly insecure about her physical appearance. Roke used his intense charisma to en um, entrance the group with his long, rambling speeches about the end of the world. He began inviting the four young people to his and Giselle's apartment on the weekends so they could sit and listen to him preach. He was making sure that they followed his word and not that of Pastor Zita. He kept them isolated from the other members so that he could create a group dynamic that he was in control of. He began gathering more members of the group, including a young woman named Nicole, who was haunted by the death of her mother. She almost immediately moved into Roke and Giselle's apartment upon meeting them. A 24-year-old young man named Claude, who had plans of being an optician. Two of Francine's friends from high school that began attending Roke sessions as well. 18-year-old Maurice and 20-year-old Jose. All in transitional periods of their lives, the young men and women were easily led to believe that they could find purpose in life through Roke's leadership and teachings. In the late summer of 1977, Roke created, uh, recruited two new pretty young women at a Seventh-day Adventist seminar retreat. Gabrielle and Yolanda were on the resort staff. Gabrielle had nursing training, which made her attractive to Roke, given his obsession with medical knowledge. She believed that he seemed like a trustworthy person, and the two girls were convinced to go back and live with the rest of the group. Jeez. Gabrielle was in her 20s and didn't fit in with the others, though. She was already well-educated and was constantly trying to impress Roke with her medical knowledge. The same reason she was recruited by Roke would also be the reason for her excessively brutal murder at the hands of Roke and his undoing. And with that, we're going to take a break for an ad. Okay. And we'll be back here in a minute. So enjoy the ad, everybody. And then we'll come back. And then we're going to come back and shit starts getting crazy. Oh, shit. 
And we're back. Some returned to fall, and while most of his followers needed to return to college, Roke convinced all of them to drop out. Because who needs school? He gonna the world's going to end, man. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck it. They began helping him with the anti-smoking programs by making vegetarian meals to serve the clinics. Roke began making several thousand dollars a week by asking attendees of the clinics for donations to the church, with the, which he then just pocketed for himself. In September of 1977, Roke recruited a 24-year-old construction worker named Jacques Zaire. Two Jacques? Two Jacques. And a wife, and his wife, uh, Maurice. So two Jacques, two Maurices. Damn. A Gabrielle, a Giselle, a Jose, a <laughs> uh, Nicole. There's a lot. There's a few people. He started um, a softball team. Pretty much. Slow pitch. <laughs> they brought their infant daughter with them. Uh, Jock was hypnotized by Roke's sermons, but Maurice had only come along to be with her husband and kept apart from the others, and unlike the other women, wasn't infatuated with Roke whatsoever. She retained her own identity among the group, but her love for her husband kept her tied to the group for years. The parents of Roke's followers were terrified what had happened to their children. Chantel's parents suspected that their daughter needed psychological help to free herself of Roke's influence. They took her to see a psychologist, and she agreed to stay in a psychiatric hospital for one month. This only, make, this only made Roke realize that he hadn't isolated his followers enough. He had to completely remove them from all outside influences. So in October of 1977, he rented a two-story building in a town about two hours away. He easily convinced Chantel to leave the hospital, and he and the group moved into the new building together in the new town. Roke and his followers would then open the Healthy Living Clinic in the town of St. Marie. Roke continued to gather more followers to work at his clinic. He also began to increase his control over his followers. He started making them all wear identical long robes and told them to give up all of their possessions. Berets are silly, but wear robes. But wear robes. <laughs> he, was stripping, he was stripping away their identities. Yeah. Uh, Giselle, still Roke's girlfriend, began to realize that his female followers all seemed to be in love with him. She was the only one actually that he was actually sleeping with, though. And in January of 78, he agreed to marry her. But there was no honeymoon, and the group activities quickly resumed like the wedding had never happened. Giselle became pregnant with their first child and grew frustrated that Roke didn't seem interested in her, so she threatened to leave. Roke responded by punching her in the face. (laughs) The other townspeople of St. Marie... My animals are fighting. The other townspeople of St. Marie began to grow suspicious of Roke, as he wasn't paying his bills and his behavior had started becoming disturbing. In March of 1978, he convinced a leukemia patient named Geraldine to leave the hospital, promising her that he could cure her with grape juice. Jeez. Because, you know, the doctors just hadn't thought of that. Yeah. It's just grape juice. They tried orange and red. But and no, a little bit of pur- no no not the purple. No one to mess with the gr- purple stuff. <laughs> you gotta get that perp. <laughs> Soon after entering his care, Geraldine died. <laughs> <laughs> Too much grape juice! <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> uh, the, the doctors weren't doing enough. I did too much. Grape juice is tricky, man. Yep, it's, it's tough. Uh, the police couldn't find a way to criminally blame Roke for her death, but they began to keep watching... Or keep... Stay the, blah, 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 blah. They started watching him. They started watching him, yeah. yeah. So after that, they were like, oh, fuck, we might need to look at this guy every once in a while. Roke began using Geraldine's death as a way to display his spiritual powers. He claimed to his followers that he had kissed her back to life before giving her to God. So it was his decision that she died. Oh, okay. Yeah. He actually cured her, but then let God have her. Yeah. Because that's... You he shared. Right. The fo- the, this finally caused Pastor Zita to kick Roke out of the church, <laughs> as he was now under far too much scrutiny. This made Roke decide to isolate his followers even further to maintain control over him. On the early morning of June 5th, 1978, Roke packed his followers into a truck, a car, and a bus, and the caravan left St. Marie forever. Police looked for all of the follower or looked for the followers after the parents had filed missing persons reports, but all they were able to find was a bag a bag containing all of the followers' ID cards. Hmm. They were going somewhere so isolated that they no longer needed government IDs. And now that he was no longer a Seventh-day Adventist, he was free to start making up his own religion to give his followers a clear vision of the future. On July 6, 1978, Roke announced to his followers that Doomsday was going to arrive in a few short months. February 17, 1979 to be exact. Oh. In Roke's version of Doomsday, great storms would destroy the Earth and only Roke and those who followed him would be safe. And because, 
Jod. And because God had chosen Roke as his personal prophet, he and his followers would then be able to create a new... Uh, oh, while they waited, they would have to create new peaceful lives in the wilderness so that after Doomsday, they could begin rebuilding society. The group found a clearing in the forest about 13 miles into the woods and away from the closest town. They decided that this is where they would wait out Doomsday, and they dubbed their new home Eternal Mountain. Uh, which, for some reason... Do you know the band Mountain Goats? The band? You ever listen to the band Mountain Goats? Oh. I think Are they, they bad? They're really... They're we, sheep, I guess. They're very... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to describe them. Um, I don't know. The guy's voice is like really... Uh, I don't know. They're very much like Bright Eyes oh, in, yeah. in a way. Yeah. I mean, different. They, they, they write a bunch of songs about wrestling. <laughs> the guy's a huge wrestling fan. But yeah, you sh- I think you dig them. Mountain goats. But I have a, I, for some reason, I keep thinking they have an album called Eternal Mountain. I oh, wonder yeah. if it's about... Anyways. <laughs> Roke made his followers cut down trees, dig a well, and build a log cabin while he sat back and relaxed. Drinking that grape drink. Drinking <laughs> that grape drink. Everyone but Roke was constantly exhausted. He kept them sleep de- deprived and easily controlled. Roke also starved his followers. They had all lost their willpower. They could no longer think for themselves. And in September of 1978, Roke gave all of his followers new names, all from the, the Bible. Uh, Giselle was renamed Esther. Solange became Rachel. Mm-hmm. So I didn't realize Rachel was a no. biblical name. Uh, Gabrielle was now Thurza. And, Rock, or, and Roke renamed himself Moses. He made his followers confess their secrets and constantly reminded them that their families and the rest of society were evil. He even renamed society the World of the Dead. Oh. It was us versus them now, and his control over the group grew almost complete. He realized that he didn't need to remain faithful faithful to Giselle, or Esther, whoever she was, <laughs> anymore, and he began Either sleeping one. with all of his female followers, uh, which he then, of course, manipulated Giselle into thinking it was all her fault, that he had to do that. Yeah. He eventually impregnated and married all of the women, nice. except for Jock's wife, Maurice. Uh, he used biblical examples like King David to justify his actions as Giselle, and since she was actually his wife, she became the head wife oh. and became mothering and began mothering the other women. His top girl. Yeah, yeah, oh. his, his top bitch. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> his, his big earner. Uh, Roke would also make his followers hike into town to buy him junk food and alcohol, abandoning his healthy lifestyle that he began as a Seventh Day Adventist. When his followers are. Uh, when his followers angered him, he would beat them with a wooden club. He also began formulating one of his most disgusting principles of the cult. His three young biological children would be considered the chosen, but any children in the cult that were not his, like Jock and Marie's daughter and infant son Samuel, Samuel were treated like slaves or animals. On December 11th, the parents of Roke's followers convinced police to pick up Roke and take him to Quebec City for a psychological evaluation. Which they did. Uh, a psychiatrist who evaluated Roke believed that he may suffer from schizophrenia, but Roke somehow convinced him that he was harmless. <laughs> he actually fooled many psychiatrists over time with his friendly, affable demeanor, when in reality he had began to brutalize his followers. In the fall of 78... Oh, and the, they'd let him go. Yeah. He went back. In the fall of 78, him. he I'm broke... Sure he, he was very uh, charismatic. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so everybody he, thought he was like a great g- yeah. dude that... In the fall of 1978, he broke two of Maurice's ribs because she was starved and pregnant and uh, ate two pancakes without asking for permission first. Oh, So she got two of her ribs broken. Uh, When she attempted to leave the group, Roke bullied her husband, Jock, into cutting off one of her toes. Jesus! Uh, So, yeah, she didn't even even buy into the shit Roke talked about. But yeah, she because she loved her husband, her husband. Yeah. she ended up going through all this shit. Lost a toe. Lost a toe. February 17th, 1978 came and went. Doomsdayless. Not a doomsday in sight, actually. Not even a smidge of doomsday. <laughs> really nice out. Sunny. <laughs> it was real nice. One of the best uh, February's we've warm. had in a while. Yeah. Uh, Roka, Roka Seasonably warm. claimed that God's understanding of time was different than that of humanity's. So naturally, it had just been a mix-up. Yeah. A goof. God time. A real sitcom situation. <laughs> His followers accepted this explanation without questioning it. Uh, Jock, not the married one, but Jock Fazay, one of the original followers in the group of four that had started all of this with Roke, fled the group briefly in 79. He refused to say anything bad about Roke, though, 
to the group of reporters. Sean uh, Chantel's report the Chantel's parents heard this and were not convinced by him. Uh, they had learned the location of the group and of Roke's doomsday prediction, and they assumed that she'd come home once the prediction turned out to be false, but she didn't. They were able to get police to take both Chantel and Roke away once again for psychiatric examinations. Psychiatrics found Chantel to be mentally healthy, and Roke was once again able to trick them into thinking he was perfectly fine. So again, they were both released. Yeah. They both went back to the group. Uh, Roke's favorite target was Jock and Maurice's infant son, Samuel. Roke would direct Jock to punish the infant whenever he cried by rolling him around in the snow naked. In 81, I don't give him to stop. In, in 81, Roke's uh, sons... The one that he had, the ones that he had with his now ex-wife Francine in the early seventies, twelve-year-old Roque Jr. and ten-year-old Francois, convinced Francine to let them join their father in the wilderness. Roque had his followers throw a celebration to welcome his eldest children. Uh, Roque's newest follower, a mentally ill young man named Guy Veer, couldn't stand two-year-old Samuel's crying during the party. So he ended up just punching the baby in the face. God damn. Instead of rushing Samuel to the... Uh, and the guy was, like, really, uh, like, mentally handicapped. Like, yeah. he was, like, like he, was, he didn't know what he was doing. Uh-huh. Um, instead of rushing Samuel to the hospital, Roke decided that this was the perfect opportunity to put his medical knowledge to work. Now, I have no idea how this has anything to do with being punched in the face, and I couldn't find any, any other information about this, but what happens next is pretty damn horrific. Uh, Roke attempted to circumcise the child with a razor blade. Oh, and as anesthetic, uh, Roke forced Samuel to drink several ounces of pure ethanol. The two-year-old died later that night. Samuel's mother, Maurice, was so sleep-deprived and broken down at this point that when she was told her son had died, she didn't even react. She just continued to do her chores. It happens. <laughs> Uh, while none of the followers were willing to blame him for Samuel's death, Roke decided a few months later to put Guy on trial for the death of Samuel. While most of the followers, which, you know, Guy had punched him in the face. That's yeah. real shitty. And then somehow Roke decided to circumcise him and fill him with ethanol. Yeah. While most of the followers Jesus. agreed that he was not to blame due to his mental illness, Roke convinced them all that Veer must be castrated. He made Veer lie back on a kitchen table and then cut his testicles off uh, with a razor blade. Roke had convinced dude, with dicks. <laughs> it's what yeah. Dicks and grape juice. <laughs> Roke had convinced Veer that the castration rel- would relieve him of his headaches. That's how he got him to lay down okay. and let this happen. Uh, but this wasn't enough for Roke. He began to torture Veer by performing mock executions of him almost daily until finally on November fifth. Uh, Guy Veer escaped and alerted authorities to Samuel's death. Due to his mental illness, he was unable to truly explain all of Roke's actions that had caused the infant's death, but the information he provided was enough for the police to arrest Roke. Uh, On December 19, 1981, Roke was found criminally responsible for Samuel's death. At the conclusion of the trial on September 29, 1982, Roke was sentenced to two years in prison. That's it? Roke's followers left the wilderness and moved south into a house in New Carlisle so that they could be near the prison. Most of the women gave birth to the children they had with Roke while he was in prison. Solange continually made attempts to leave the group and return home to her family, but from prison, Roke would convince her to stay. And Giselle even allowed her to become the primary wife so that she stayed with the cult. Wow, new number one. Yeah. In February of 1984, Roke got out of prison. It didn't take long for him to convince his followers to abandon their city life and return to the wilderness. Come on. So in April of, 90, of 84, Roke bought a landlocked wooded property in Victoria County, which was English-speaking, which was an English-speaking community. Uh, all of Roke's followers spoke French, so this allowed the English-speaking Roke to be the only one that was actually able to communicate uh, with the other people. Yeah, more. completely. On May 2nd, 1984, Roke and his followers returned to the wilderness, and once again, Roke sat back while his followers worked and built their new community. The women in the group gave birth to even more of Roke's children, and food once began, and food once again became a major problem. He originally had his followers shoplift from a nearby town, but when they were caught in January of 85, Roke developed an idea of how creating roadside farm stands would allow his followers to sell fresh produce. Fresh produce. Uh, this was a success, and somehow, 
being able to say like, hey, look at these um, produce stands and look at how uh-huh. good I am at business. He convinced uh, this company that did wholesale equipment to give him bakery equipment that I'm sure he was supposed to pay for, but he yeah. just never did. Yeah. And he started a bakery company that he called, that he named the Ant Hill Kids. Ah. This name was devised from Roke's habit of, compar- of comparing the group to a colony of ants, all functioning as one for the good of the group. Roke still had severe stomach pains, and he'd begin drinking even hev- even more heavily once again in an attempt to suppress the pain. He also began to develop more ways to torture his followers. He would make them participate in group orgies, he would piss in their mouths, whip them, and beat them with a hammer or the blunt side of an axe. He even ordered the group to circumcise Jock, I don't know which one, Ugh. by slicing off the tip of his penis. Fuck! Nobody else, no dudes are allowed to have a dick. Ah! His followers were terrified. I didn't know there'd be so much dick slicing a lot in this of dick episode. Cutting. Golly! Yeah. Uh, his, ter- his followers were terrified to leave. They All truly believed, holes. so they were starting to kind of um, be like, oh, fuck. This is this guy's crazy. Yeah. But they honestly believed that he was a prophet of God. So they were afraid to cross him because in their minds that would be the same as crossing God. Yeah. So even though some of them started to come around, they were still so warped by this religious shit that uh by this time social workers had begun to get involved when she's, when they suspected that he was abusing the children in the group. These suspicious these suspicions grew when on January 26, 1985, Gabrielle left her infant son out in the cold overnight, causing him to freeze to death. Despite the obvious neglect and mistreatment, and the whole being frozen thing, <laughs> the coroner simply listed the cause of death as SIDS, which back then used to be like a catch-all reason yeah. for baby. Like, they just, baby yep, SIDS. SIDS. Um, the social workers began consulting with a non-profit group called the Council on Mind Abuse, and realized that Roke was running a cult. The social workers yeah, began thanks. watching Roke closely, which caused Roke to grow even more unstable. In March of 1985, a social worker tried to visit the cult's children, and Roke lost shit on her. In June of 85, Roke got drunk off his ass and told his cult that the doomsday had arrived and began using his radio to make phony distress calls to passing aircraft. So the mm. dude was, like, slipping out of yeah. reality even more. Um, which, you know, you would wonder if... Up to this point, he knew what was... Like, he was in clear mind. Yeah. But at some point, even he started to lose his fucking mind. So he just slipped further and further. all that power and just... Yeah. Over just just delusional. Anyway. Yeah. In October of 85, Maurice finally abandoned the group. Uh, the Maurice that was married. Taking her young children with her. Social workers interviewed her and found out that Roke was abusing the children, both sexually and physically, throwing wow. them into trees whenever he was angry. This was the proof of abuse authorities needed, and on December 6, 1985, social workers raided the commune and took away the cult's 13 children. It was only after the children were placed with foster families that the extent of Roke's abuse became clear. Uh, once again, here's a warning. Oh, shit. We're going to find out some details about what happened. Once they got away from Roke, they were able they to They started to find and, out what was happening to the yeah. kids. So, uh, if you don't want to hear this, I get it. I don't want to hear this. Yeah, so there's some shit about what happens to the kids. And then we'll get back into what happens with him and the adults. So, just there you go. Uh, Roke was the only one who was allowed to comfort or show love to the children. They figured out. When he wasn't comforting them, though, or treating them well, he was beating them or crushing their fingers to stop them from crying. Uh, He not only made the children watch the group orgies, he also forced them to participate. At Roke's encouragement, the children would sexually abuse animals and each other. God. Some fucking how... Knowing all of this, Roke wasn't put away. He remained free. He even manipulated the court-appointed psychologist into siding with him. Ah. The psychologist actually expressed admiration for Roke's lifestyle and insisted that none of the children had been abused. She claimed that Roke was the victim of a prejudiced society and advised the court to give the children back to Roke. That same psychologist in 1993, after Roke had been arrested and found guilty of murder, refused to admit that she was wrong and insisted still that he had never abused children. (laughs) Thankfully, the judge wasn't batshit crazy, though, (laughs) and saw through Roke's facade. The judge reprimanded the psychologist in open court for her behavior, and on October 27, 1987, he ruled that the children should be permanently taken away from the cult. Good. So at least that 
is yeah. good. I mean, uh, they didn't have to continue living in hell. That guy held some power over people. So, however, he didn't get the children back, but he did remain a free man. Uh, free man. And with the children now gone, Roke became even more violent and unpredictable. He began, or he burned the skin off several followers with a blowtorch. Jesus. He punched one of his pregnant wives in the stomach, causing a miscarriage. He yanked the teeth out of several cult members' mouths, and the followers forgave him every single time. By the fall of 1988, the cult members were completely fucked up. <laughs> Mentally, physically, emotionally, they were wiped out and worn down by a lack of sleep and food in an endless cycle of abuse. Solange had been complaining of stomach pains, prompting Rogue to announce that he would be performing surgery on her. Oh, good. Remember, she was the one that had... But she doesn't have a dick to uh, surprise. Right. So, but remember, she was the one that had medical knowledge. Yeah, okay. So, um, so he announced he'd be performing surgery on her and that he would be operating on her liver. Rogue gave Solange an unsanitary enema filled with molasses, oil, and water. He Upper s- butt? Yeah. <laughs> He sliced her stomach open and began ripping out her intestines. Ah! No one did anything to help her, but some did assist Roke with sticking a tube down Solange's throat for no reason whatsoever. Just something he told him to do. Yeah. Solange died the next morning, following a night spin in agonizing pain. Oh, man. This didn't even shake Roke's followers, though. And on October 22nd, 19, er, and on October 22nd Roke married the now-deceased Solange in a bizarre ceremony. And then Roke completely lost his fucking mind. <laughs> After he married the dead girl, then he lost his mind. So he somehow began communication with a psychiatrist from Utah named Jess Grossbeck. And through his communication, he became obsessed with the idea that he was going to give birth to Solange. Who he married. Who he, he married murdered. the dead corp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he got the idea by perverting by perverting a Genesis chapter from the Bible. Uh, just as God created Eve out of Adam's rib, Roke believed that Solange would be reborn out of his own rib, which he never really went through with. Like he just, for some reason, obsessed with this idea that yeah. he was going to be able to give Solange rebirth. Uh, Roke continued to operate on Solange's corpse after ah. he ordered his followers to dig up her body. He removed several of her organs and bones and then used her corpse to commit horrific acts of necrophilia. Even after the cult well, that's members... That's his wife, okay? <laughs> First of all, So the cult love. burned her remains so, so they would be able to just end the shit. Like, they didn't know any other way to... But that didn't stop him. He used a jar of her bones oh to, like, I don't know what he did with them, but, like, he, they said, like, he continued his necrophiliac shit with her bones. So, take that for what it's worth. I don't know what... I don't want to think about what you do. <laughs> he even made a necklace out of one of her ribs and just wore it constantly. In the summer of 89, the police finally arrested Roke for the final time. Roke had singled Gabrielle out over the decade. Oh, no, so Gabrielle was the one with the medical training. Sorry. Okay. Uh, he had singled her out throughout this whole, like, ten years. Like, he constantly gave her shit. Uh, due to the superiority, the superiority complex and all that, he couldn't yeah, stand that smart. she was able to yeah. just have the same or more medical knowledge than he did. Uh, so he made sure that he tormented her more than most. On July 29th, 18, or 1989, Roke drunkenly proclaimed that he would once again be performing surgery of sorts. He, gr- he, ga- ugh. he grabbed Gabrielle and impaled her hand with a knife. He tortured her for hours before he finally grabbed a meat cleaver and just chopped her arm off. Jeez. She ran away to a women's shelter, but one of, I don't know which one, one of the jock, jocks found her and convinced her to return home. <laughs> just a few days later, on August 11th, 1989, Roke made his followers hold Gabrielle down while he tortured her by placing a flame-heated piece of metal uh, against her stump. Ugh. Gabrielle once again escaped to the women's shelter, and this time she went to a hospital where she was questioned by police, but she made up a story that Roke had cut her arm off after she'd been pinned down following a car accident. So still covering for the guy. Yeah. Even after... So I think up in the beginning of this, I said that um, it led to her death. Uh-huh. So she didn't die. Okay. So, yeah, she Solange, when she escaped she got, that time yeah. in the hospital, she was away. She was gone from it. Uh, police, even being given this story about the car accident... They knew this was yeah. a lie that she was covering, so they went and arrested him. On August 19th, they searched the compound, but everyone was gone. So they went to arrest him, but he was gone. His followers had finally left him, 
after what he had done to Gabrielle, and Roque was now on the run. Only Jacques, Nicole, and Chantel remained by his side. They evaded police for almost two months, but on October 6th, he was finally caught. The same the same day, Giselle, um, his actual wife, yeah. confessed the truth about Solange's death, and Roque was charged with murder. He was convicted of second-degree murder. Somehow still, psychiatrists could not be convinced that Roque was anything but a bright and sensitive young man <laughs> with a considerable knowledge of medicine. Which, I mean... You would think for somebody that read a ton of medical textbooks, you would that slicing open a body and pulling out the guts, yeah, like tube down the throat, enema of all that, no stuff, finesse, and <laughs> like it'd be cutting off an arm. It'd be one thing I could underst- I couldn't understand it, but like it'd make more sense if he like was delicately like performing surgeries yeah. for no reason, and they just died from you know yeah. still just yeah. not having the best facilities. Well, they'd be like missing arms and shit. Yeah. He'd, like so, but just to be like and hack 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 <laughs> yank yank yank. <laughs> Um, they believe that he was simply an extra, an extraordinary person in an ordinary world and recommended that the court set Roke free. Eh. Fortunately, once again, whoever the judge was, I don't know if the same one or not, but they were not having it. Um, and instead, on January 18th, 1993, Roke was sentenced to 10 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Gabrielle was able to get therapy and began reading books on cults. Learning uh, the ability to recognize the dangerous psychological techniques Roe could use to manipulate his victims. She would later publish a memoir called The Alliance of Sheep. Uh, Roke's two eldest sons also published a, mem- a memoir about what they had lived through. Most of his victims remained anonymous, just trying to regain their lives and living with friends and family. Many received still financial assistance through the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board in Ontario. Ontario. Francine, Chantel, and Nicole all rented homes near the prison Roke was in and continued to see him in prison and have his children. The three opened a bakery together. Oh, wow. Which was very successful until people realized who they were. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately for Roke, his charisma and cult leader personality did not create a new group of followers for him in prison. He was actually despised in prison due to his past crimes. And on February 23rd, 2011... Roke's cellmate, Matthew McDonald, stabbed him in the neck, or stabbed him to death with a shiv to the neck. Uh, McDonald pleaded guilty. Someone lost my place. Oh, he was pleaded guilty to second degree murder. He was already sentenced to life in prison yeah. um, for a previous murder charge. McDonald had stabbed Roke in the neck with a shiv, walked to the guard station, handed him the weapon, and proclaimed, That piece of shit is dead on the range. Here's the knife. I've sliced him up. <laughs> Open and shot. So that is the story of Roke Thorold and the Ant Hill Kids. What uh, a piece of shit. Yeah, like I was telling you when I got to the end of that, like when I found out what happened, like I actually got chills and I was yeah. like, "Fuck yes!" Like I was so happy that some dude was just like, "Fuck this guy." Yeah. So he was actually his cellmate too. So like I don't know how long he, he like had to spend time with this guy. Yeah, he just listened to him talk and yeah. probably not long. I yeah, I don't know. I can't imagine. So yeah, pretty fucked up stuff. Um. I think I was just trying to outdo you in the, uh, <laughs> this guy's a piece of shit. Cutting into dicks? Dude, very into cutting off dicks. <laughs> like, you would think he had a big one. Like, let it go, man. Yeah. Like, you won. Yeah, he won already. So, yeah, I don't understand, uh, how people can fall into cults like that. Like, be like, that easily swayed. Yeah. People are just looking for something, Something, man. So, so there you go. Uh. I need a shower now. Yeah. Yeah, very awful shit that he did to kids, and so luckily the kids got taken away. Yeah, so there was a little bit of a good ending for them, even uh, though I can't how even many imagine. Kids he ended up having with all those people. Like they took thirteen, Jeez. so I wonder how many like weren't even. Yeah, like I wonder how many they actually had, and had died before. Yeah, so and then like the three women kept apparently like I would say conjugal visits in yeah. prison, opened up a bakery. Jesus Christ! So there you go. So, hey, you want to talk about, you want to do funny stuff now? <laughs> yeah. Lighten the fucking mood a little bit? I have some would-you-rathers. All right. And I actually wrote these. I didn't steal them off the internet, which probably won't be good because I didn't steal them off the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's only so many on the internet. <laughs> this is like the lightest thing to follow with. The most like, would you rather be a millionaire yeah. that lives for five years, or would you live forever and be poor? Mmm. You just be all of mine. Would you rather have baby feet or baby hands? Oh. 
<laughs> baby feet wouldn't support my body. Uh, baby hands would just look. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want either. Um, uh, it's a tough one. I mean, baby hands, my dick would look bigger. Oh, there you go. So, and you'd be able to balance. I don't think you could balance well without with little baby feet. I don't, I'd just be like, I I'd, be, I'd walk though. like a baby. Yeah. Uh, it'd be easier to find shoes. <laughs> Probably cheaper. cheaper. Yeah. Uh, I'll go with baby hands. All right, baby hands. I think that's what I would probably yeah. do. Yeah. I mean, would it end like, so would the baby hands be. Just on there, like, your wrist. Say, like, keep my same arm. Yeah. So, like, down to, the, like, my wrist, and then there's a, there's a little baby hand attached. A little to tiny the, baby to hand. The exact same arm. <laughs> yep. And then a little baby hand. <laughs> a little tiny baby hand. Yeah, I could get a job at a carnival. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Call you baby hands cash, I guess. I don't know. Um, would you rather go back and do 12th grade all over again right now at your age? Okay. Or would you rather teach a kindergarten class for a year? Either one. <laughs> I'd be fine with either. Uh, redoing 12th grade, I only had two classes. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even go. <laughs> I had an English class. It'd be easier than what your life is right now, probably. Well, I had an English class and I had a health class. And the first week of my English class, I asked my teacher if he would be cool if I stopped in the beginning of the week and picked up the assignments, that as long as I kept an A, yeah. would he be cool with me not showing up to class? And he told me if I could keep an A, that was fine with him. So then he went and talked to my health teacher and convinced him to do the same thing. Ah. So I didn't even go. <laughs> I was there once a week. Oh, my God. Picked up my stuff, did the work, dropped it back off on a Friday. I Captain A. Do school. Do but then the fucking health teacher. Uh, so right before I'm about to graduate, I get a call. I get called to the principal's office. I get a call to, to come see the principal. Uh-huh. And they tell me I'm going to fail because I never showed up for health class. Oh. And I'm like, I have an A. The health teacher had told them that he never agreed to it. So my English teacher, Mr. Yoke at PHS, went to the principal and was like, fuck that. Yeah. No, he did. So, like, he got me, like, if it wasn't for that dude, I would have had to redo my senior year. Oh, so you almost had to redo your yeah. senior year. But I'd be cool with teaching kindergarten, too. That'd yeah. be fun. I mean, what do you, they take a nap for, t- like, an hour. Uh, I don't think so in kindergarten, pre-K, maybe. You don't take a nap in kindergarten? I don't think so. I don't think, I, I thought think I you did. do. Maybe you used to. Shit's maybe you used changed. to. Now but, I mean, take, still, what do you now do? Now you're taking, like, Spanish and, like, sign Whatever. language. Okay, I'll blow right. English. <laughs> Ah, that's a dumb one then. I'm sorry. No, either one would be fine. Be, <laughs> if you told me right now, like, hey, you get to spend a year of your life either teaching, yeah, kindergarten, or I'd be like, just pick one. I'm cool with it, man. That's yeah. so much better than what I'm doing. I don't think I'd want to be around a bunch of 17-year-olds. <laughs> like, right now? Yeah, because you're be, going back right now. You're not, like, going back and doing it again. I like, would be a cult leader. Yeah. <laughs> I would tell, like, you guys want to know the truth? Like, you right now, 30-whatever-year-old cat. 37. Hanging out with 17-year-olds. I have like, 20 years of experience on them. <laughs> I'd be like, you guys want to know the I'm fucking, sure they'd listen to it you all, You guys want to know the truth about this shit? <laughs> oh, I'd be every I remember when I was 17, I just couldn't wait to listen to people. <laughs> I'd offer them drugs, man. <laughs> okay. I'd get them. <laughs> like, that old guy's got good drugs, man. Yeah, I'd buy him beer. <laughs> Whose dad is that? <laughs> no one, man. Because let me tell you about life. <laughs> you guys want to do it right? <laughs> you show how to do it right. You too can have your own podcast. <laughs> All right, last one. Uh, never have any cash ever. You can only use a card. Okay. Or you can have cash, but it's only dollar bills. I don't ever really have cash now. Oh, okay. Uh, I always just have my card. I always think it's a hassle to use the card for everything. I use cash. To me, it's a hassle. My check is direct deposited. Yeah. So there's just a hassle to like, go get cash. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just, I guess, keep never doing what I'm cash. doing. Yep. Yeah. Say goodbye to strip clubs. I haven't been to a strip club in so long. Don't lie. Actually, I went last year when JD <laughs> See? Santos came into town. See? Don't lie. But he's all Hollywood now. Yeah. And paid for everything. Oh, so he didn't need cash. Yeah. No, he yeah. like he went in because he lives in Georgia, but he like works in Hollywood all the time. Mm-hmm. For he like runs a stunt company, and he does movies with like The Rock and Bruce Willis and fucking everybody. So he gets here. He hasn't been here in years. He gets here. We go to the place out here in Route Two. And he walks in and he's like, uh, 
asked to get apparently like in real cities you can get like shitloads of money you just like give them like you can run the ATM oh yeah get whatever well here you can get like a hundred bucks uh huh so he was trying to get like a few thousand dollars and they were like yeah you can't do that <laughs> he's like well, I mean I want to tip like I want to spend it yeah and they're like you can't <laughs> so like he had to like keep getting multiple like he had to go to other banks uh, he ended up getting like a few thousand dollars geez. paid for all the drinks put it all on the tab we, like we never even went to the stage we all hung out in the back near the pool tables uh-huh. and just like drank and he would go up every time a new dancer would come on he would go up to the ta- go up the stage and just throw a shitload of money make it rain and then come back like wouldn't even like pay attention yeah. we'd just go up and be like there you go I was like, it must be fucking nice, man. <laughs> How's it feel to be? How's it feel to be? That's that big dick energy. He has so much money, oh. but he never he got he never got married and never had kids. That's smart. So he just <laughs> yeah. So he just has all of his money now. It's quit blown wrestling. It, blown in our strippers. He quit wrestling ten years ago. Yeah. So he got to like stay healthy. <laughs> Still has knees. Started doing yeah. Started doing stunt work. Cool. Yeah, just did a movie. He just, he worked on like Bad Boys, the new Bad Boys for life. Basically, any TV show you see that has action stuff in it, uh-huh. he's in it. Hmm. Yeah, motherfucker's doing well. Yeah. He should go teach the high school kids. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to him. I want to teach them what I learned from him. Okay. I'm like, don't don't follow my example. <laughs> listen to my words, because I, I teach I, what I others do. I won't go near him because they'll make fun of me. <laughs> like when I was last time, I was you, in high school. Is that what you'd be worried about? <laughs> yes. Being made fun of. <laughs> Yes. I'm going to teach my kindergartners. Who gives a fuck what a 17-year-old thinks? I don't know shit. Uh, it's me, I do. You better be older than me if you're going to give me any goddamn <laughs> criticism. Oh, man. You're the only one allowed to criticize me. You're older than me. Yeah. You're the oldest person I know, man. Really? No. I did it. I have a dad. Oh. <laughs> I know, it's me. And a mom. <laughs> that's the and there's spo- other elderly people that's I know. That's the spoiler alert. All right. I'm the oldest person in this room. That's true. Yep. That's true. Yeah. Very true. <laughs> You're looking around like there's no one else here. Else well, I was trying to see if I had anything. <laughs> so when I'm in the corner, nope, I let him that go. That piano I have probably older than you. Oh, sure. I'm going to take that home with me. If you can move it, <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> I want it out of here, but it's too fucking big. all the toys big. on top. If you will take the piano, you can have everything on I don't top think, of it. I think they built the room around the piano. They did, I don't man. think you there's can get no that way. piano out of here. You'd have to like chainsaw it in pieces. I don't even understand how it's in this room well, this, right now. this room was built onto the house. Yeah. And they so, like they put the floor and they're like, all right, move the piano in. Yeah, and they built I those walls the around somewhere it. in the house and they just shoved it in mm-hmm. here. Greased it up and shoved it. it in. It takes up so much room. You could have been using all this quarantine time to be learning the piano. I need to like, don't you have to tune the piano? Eh. Who even tunes a piano now? How much piano would that tuners? cost? <laughs> I don't know. That's got to be such a specialty thing now yeah. that people are like, oh, six thousand dollars. <laughs> You're like, okay, I guess, man. <laughs> <You're the only laughs> that seems right. You're the only one that can do it. <laughs> All right. Well, we've done enough here. Yes. I think we've done God's work again, again, again. It's what we do, yep. man. Nothing to solve here, though. No. Usually we solve these crimes, but this one, pretty open and shut case. He's an Dude asshole. Was a fucking lunatic. Dick. So I'm glad he got shivved in prison. Yep, fuck him. Could have been a better ending. They should have stabbed his eyes out. Yeah. I mean, it would have been good if like he got skull fucked a little bit yeah. before he his, died. Cut his dick off. Oh, that would have been the best. Yeah. That was his precious. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're out of here. Thanks. Uh, follow, like, subscribe, all that stuff. We're yep. on iTunes now or whatever the fuck it's called these days. Uh, so go and listen to that. Uh, and go listen to the last episode. Yeah, that's a good one. Episode 22. Go listen to that. I don't know why the fuck there's not more listens on it. It's a very good episode. What do you it's, people it's that do? that guy's with? picture that we posted with it. Maybe. What else do you guys have to do? Put like a filter on it where it like does, you know, changes them up a little Instagram bit. Instagram filter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll try that. We'll do that. All right, until next time, uh, go watch The Lighthouse. Yeah. Um, watch the Michael Jordan documentary that's out, the first two episodes. It's amazing. Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time. I don't want to fucking hear an argument. <laughs> LeBron's like two. Maybe three, because I think Kobe's two. Yeah, I'd say Kobe's two. It's all, they're all good. MJ, Kobe, LeBron. Yep. And we're out.